Mr. Hayes served as the first U.S. ambassador to South Sudan, also as a special representative to the U.N. Secretary General for Justice Support in Haiti, uh, and so has a lot of topical and regional expertise relevant to today's discussion of election monitoring in Guyana. So if I could, Ambassador Page, I'll turn over to you to introduce uh, our guests. Thank you very much, John. Um, it's really a delight to be here today and to introduce everyone. Um, we are going to be talking about the elections in Guyana and how three different organizations uh, observed those elections from uh, the very early days of when it was determined necessary that an election needed to take place, uh, all the way to uh, the contestation of the counting of the ballots and then what is going on right now. So it is with great pleasure that I first will introduce Mr. Jason Carter. He is the chairman of the Carter Center Board of Trustees and a partner at the law firm of Bondurant, Mixon and Elmore LLP in Atlanta, Georgia, where he represents clients in high stakes business litigation. He is also the grandson of the Carter Center's founders former president Jimmy Carter and his wife, Rosalind Carter. Um, and he's been intricately involved in the Carter Center's programs for 20 years, working to advance peace and health across the globe. Um, he has also, uh, he also co-led this particular uh, electoral observation mission to Guyana, uh, which I also participated on and had the first opportunity to meet Mr. Carter in person. Um, and we're just delighted that you are able to be with us uh, today. Um, next, we have Ms. Fern Narcis Scope. She is the Chief Elections Officer of the Elections and Boundaries Commission of Trinidad and Tobago. She's representing CARICOM, which is the, communi the Caribbean community, which is a regional grouping of the Caribbean countries. I'm not gonna name all of them, there are many, but. Um, if you do want a list, I can provide that for you. Um, Ms. Narcis Scope, like our two other panelists, is also a lawyer. Um, she graduated from the University of the West Indies in Cave Hill and St. Augustine campuses. And her wide and varied experience includes positions as legal counsel, corporate secretary at several state enterprises, and as legal officer at one of Trinidad and Tobago's government ministries. She specializes in public corporate governance, public administrative law, and governmental procedures and practices. And finally, we have Ms. Pauline Chase. She is the secretary of the Bar Association of Guyana, a position to which she has been elected for the past four years. I do have to tell this one tale on her because I got to know her a little bit well, uh, a little bit while I was in Guyana. And she graduated from high school and started university at the age of 15. So um, I'm just sitting back here humbled. Um, and after high school, she has now been practicing law for 20 years. And she is a senior partner at the law firm of Ashton Chase Associates. Her wide civil, civil practice includes litigation before the various courts in Guyana in areas of law such as family, labor, constitution, and commerce. So without further ado, um, we will start with Mr. Carter. And um, it's again, he will give a little bit of an overview of uh, just the background very briefly about Guyana. And then each of the uh, speakers will talk for a few minutes uh, in, in order about what they, uh, the role that they played in observing Guyana's elections in 2020. All right, Mr. Carter, over to you. Thank you so much, uh, Ambassador Page, who I generally refer to as Susan. <laughs> I appreciate um, uh, you being here. I'm excited about your uh, new role uh, there at the University of Michigan. Um, and if there's a, a couple things, I will get into it, but I'm, I'm honored to be here with Ms. Narcissope and Ms. Chase. And I, I will say that one of the things that I have learned in the last several years getting involved in Guyanese politics and Caribbean politics, there's a lot of legal maneuvering. There are a lot of lawsuits. And I have spent a lot of time listening to people in court. And I think everyone who's listening today to the two of these women speak will realize just how uh, great it is to have a Caribbean lawyer. 
<laughs> because <laughs> it, it nothing sounds better uh, in making a legal argument than than this group of people, and I think you guys will appreciate that when we when we come to it. But Guyana is in the Caribbean. It is also in South America. For those of you who are are new to the study of Guyana, um, and it has a been for many years uh, has a very interesting history. Uh, among other things, uh, its population is very diverse racially. Uh, there is a large Afro-Guyanese population and a very large Indo-Guyanese population. Um, and then, of course, a variety of other um, groups that are mixed in, in in a host of ways, including Amerindian population in sort of the northern, excuse me, the southern part uh, of Guyana. And that racial diversity um, over time um, and given the, the various different aspects of its post-colonial history um, has led to a, 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 a real racial polarization uh, for the most part among the political parties. And you know, that, if that sounds familiar to the Americans here, um, you know, you'll, you'll know what I mean. Uh, and so that, in that context, there was a, a period of time and, and Pauline um, will be able to talk in more depth, uh, obviously uh, having grown up in Guyana and being the true expert, but just sort of as, a, as, a, as a, uh, an overview, um, the Carter Center has been involved since 1990. Um, there was a very long period of time where uh, a, a single um, party ruled Guyana. There was then a, a series of sort of democratic transitions that occurred beginning really in 1990, um, where a new group came into power. Um, that group then stayed in power for a very long time. Uh, the Carter Center came back, observed another election um, for another transfer of power. Um, and then as it's moved forward, the Carter Center itself has, has observed elections in 110 uh, different elections since 1989, um, including 39 countries. But Guyana, we have been to on multiple occasions and have been integrally involved in some of the real reforms that, that Guyana ha has and, and still needs, frankly. And one of the issues in Guyana, as I mentioned, you have racial polarization among the political parties, and you also have really a winner-take-all system so that if one political party wins, uh, then the other group of people or the people associated with the other political party feel uh, very left out. Um, and there is a, a, a huge amount of power concentrated in the president and in their parliamentary system. And so what has happened and what happened to trigger this most recent election um, is that the, the, the political party that was in power, um, which was really a, an alliance, one of the first uh, that they've had between a, a predominantly Afro-Guyanese party and a relatively small uh, Indo-Guyanese party, that coalition government was in power with a very slim majority in the parliament. And uh, what happened is, is that uh, last year, there was a vote of no confidence in the government. That vote of no confidence involved a single member of the parliament um, leaving the coalition and voting along with the opposition in order to force, in essence, a, a dissolution of the government. Now, that triggered months and months of legal maneuvering, as I mentioned. There were a huge number of legal cases. They were argued in a variety of contexts. And one of the things that would be interesting um, is, that, is that Guyana is a part of the Caribbean Court of Justice, um, which is something that is not in Guyana, but is still the highest court of Guyana, which, uh, again, others can talk about more later. But as that process unfolded, the Constitution required uh, an election be held because of the vote of no confidence. And so there was months and months of legal maneuvering. The Carter Center, including me, were actually involved very early on in trying to broker uh, a various different set of compromises, and in particular, questions about how to conduct the election. Just like in the United States, there were serious questions about voter registration practices. What was the best and most appropriate way to register those voters? What, did the, what was the state of the voter list? How were they going to ensure that people who were overseas but Guyanese um, citizens would be able to come home and vote. Uh, a, hu a huge number of issues that were uh, laid out. So eventually the election was scheduled. Um, the Carter Center was invited um, to come and participate as international observers in that election. And as I mentioned, the Carter Center has done that 110 times uh, since 1989 um, in many, many countries. But in addition to the Carter Center, there were a number of other both international organizations regional organizations and then domestic observers who were participating in that election and, and Pauline uh, and Ms. Narcissa Scope, uh, Ms. Narcissa Scope again from CARICOM represents the most important um, regional body that sent an observation mission and it's incredibly important that that regional those regional leaders are incredibly important to Guyana um, and then of course Pauline represents uh, the um, 
Bar Association in Guyana, which was a neutral group that was also observing the election, similar to we would have observers uh, looking here in the United States. And so all of that to say that it was a very well observed election. Um, and it was one in which uh, there were a, a host of sort of issues on election day or a host of small issues. And then um, at the end, in essence, during the tabulation process for the largest county, um, which is uh, the largest region, as they call it, uh, in Guyana, um, there was a, a serious breach of uh, transparency uh, during which the, um, the, the election commission stopped counting uh, in a transparent way the ballots uh, that had been cast in that particular uh, area um, and began announcing results without having transparently concluded that count. Uh, this caused all of the international observers, many of the regional observers, many of the domestic observers um, to uh, sound the alarm, um, including the Carter Center. Um, we had multiple um, press conferences and statements about this irregularity uh, and the lack of transparency and the, and the, and the uh, resulting lack of confidence and, um, in, in, the, in the result, the lack of credibility in the result. And so this was a fascinating election. That then triggered, that was literally uh, the week before the United States shut down because of the coronavirus. So it was in early March uh, of this year. And so coupled with uh, the coronavirus's complications, Guyana then began and, and, and carried out a, a very complicated set of recounts and legal wrangling um, that ultimately resulted in a president from the opposition party being sworn in recently. And, and obviously, uh, Ms. Chase, uh, who I keep calling Pauline, and I apologize, Pauline, uh, we've known each other for a while. Uh, you call me Jason for sure, um, that we um, uh, can talk more about, but but that is that is what we're looking at: a, a country that has extreme polarization with respect to race, that has a complicated history of, of recriminations, that has a winner-take-all system where the side that loses feels like they're very much left out, and that kind of heightened awareness is something that I think Americans can feel right now. Uh, and so it's a very interesting process to look and think about what happens, um, how an election, what a major irregularity looks like, and then how the political parties through the courts and otherwise uh, have come together to deal with a, a series of constitutional crises. So I'm looking forward to the discussion and it's nice to be here again. Thank you, Ambassador Page. Great, thank you very much. Um, all of us know each other, so it is a little odd that we're all calling each other by our formal names, but. I wanna be respectful. Please do, um, panelists, feel free to call me by my first name, Susan, which is what we all call each other um, by our first names, but um, I do wanna be respectful. And since the students are here, uh, I don't want to make it super casual. And let me just say that um, we will take questions from uh, the audience. Uh, so once everyone finishes, um, their kind of opening remarks, we will get to the questions because I think as um, Mr. Carter mentioned, one of the things that is that we're looking at is how things might play out for elections in the United States and if there might uh, be similarities. So I know that that will come up. And one of the issues that arose early on uh, in the Guiana process was even when elections would be scheduled and because of all of the um, debate and court cases and arguments, um, even that was pushed off quite late. And that also began a process of sort of, maybe not tainting the process, but making people afraid about whether or not the results would in fact um, be credible. So next, let me turn to um, Ms. Uh, Narcisco and she is representing CARICOM. And again, um, you know, the regional communities are based on economic integration and um, trying to make sure that regional organizations come together and promote a common, uh, a common foreign policy, a common unity of effort, especially economically. So Ms. Nurses Scope. Hi, uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, so from my perspective, um, first, let me talk a little bit about CARICOM. So CARICOM is really a grouping of 20 countries, 15 member states and five associate members. It is home to approximately 16 million citizens, 60% of which are under the age of 30. So we have a very young 
um, population in, 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 in the Caribbean region. Um, it stretches to, uh, from Baham the Bahamas in the north to Suriname and Guyana in South America, as well as includes Belize in Central America. And I am representing, uh, my participation in the, in the mission was that of representing Trinidad and Tobago, a twin island republic that is a part of CARICOM. And um, to your students, you would know Trinidad and Tobago because we have contributed to Carnival and Calypso and Soca. So if you know that music, it all comes from my country and, 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 the, and the Caribbean region. Um, so CARICOM came into being in 1973. And since then, it, it really was an economic and, and, and continues to be an economic and, and social partnership. And one of, the, one of the things about CARICOM is that we are countries, the, the countries of CARICOM, we share a common heritage in that we are, we've all moved from colonialism into self-government, some form of self-government. And, and that colonialism has by and large majorly been, been under the British. So that you find that from a, a, a law perspective, a Commonwealth perspective, and, and I think Pauline, um, if, I, if I can call you Pauline, Pauline will speak more to that um, when she speaks, but in terms of what we share as a region, we do have very simil similar legislative backgrounds. And so um, in every country, you will see that we, uh, the, the legislative process for elections is governed by and large by a representation of the People's Act. That's what the legislation is called. And all the islands or countries share that legislation in various formats, but very, very similar. Um, so in terms of, of CARICOM, we, CARICOM itself started election observer missions in 2000. So it's, it's really, they've only been in the business for, 20, for just about 20 years. And the first missions that CARICOM did uh, was to Haiti and Suriname, the general elections that both countries had in that year. But since 2000 to now, they, CARICOM has mounted over 50 election observer missions. Now, in terms of the missions themselves, the missions tend to be short missions. We generally would go in for just about 10 days um, and and, and it, it's in three phases. You look at the pre-election period, the election day itself, and then the post-election period. So in terms of the Guyana context, the chief of mission, and that's the person um, who is the head of mission, that person is selected from amongst the, the nominees from the various countries who would have submitted a nominee to participate in the election. And the nominees tend to be persons who have election experience um, or a senior electoral officials such as myself. Um, so that in the case of the Guyana, Guyana election, the head of mission were, is actually the, the chairperson for the St. Lucia Elections Commission, the island of St. Lucia. And so she was the head of mission and, and the head of mission um, forms an advanced party. So they tend to go in in the early 10 day period and they would meet with various stakeholders in the election process. So political parties, uh, both the incumbent and opposition parties, uh, NGOs, civil society, the police service, all the, the, the arms that would be interested in the election and its outcome, all those interested parties, uh, that advanced party would meet with, with a view to finding uh, a determination of the pre-election atmosphere and noting whatever are the concerns of all these various very important bodies in the, in the, in, in the country. Um, thereafter that, the remaining team members would come in and we would visit one of the primary and most important uh, entities that we visit would be that electoral management body in the, respect, in the respective country. So in this case, um, Guyana's Elections Commission or the show, otherwise known as GCOM. So we would have visited there to ascertain how ready GCOM was for the election. Um, so we had several meetings with GCOM in, in that regard to determine their readiness. And of course, um, 
at the time, in the lead up to the 2nd of March, they were ready or claimed to be ready. Um, all the activities had been, you know, everything that had been needed to be done had been done by that time. And so we also, of course, we are deployed on election day and we visit polling stations. So in the context of Guyana, they had just about, um, I think it was over 2000 polling stations and we visited 360 out of those um, 2000 plus polling stations. So it's, it's a percentage of the polling stations that you are able to visit. Um, Guyana um, is a vast country, 10 regions. And so we did, um, I think it was, a, it was probably four or five of the regions we were able to deploy team members to visit. Um, of course, um, different terrain, across Guyana, urban, rural, um, very rural in some, in some, in some areas. So it's, it's, it's difficult. It would, have, it would have been difficult to do all, you know, a larger percentage of the, um, the polling stations. But we did do just about 360 polling stations. And so, and, and looking at the op opening of the poll, um, the conduct of the poll itself, and close of poll procedures. And of course, the whole tabulation and preparation of statement of the poll. Now, all these, these, these activities form part of the election day procedures. And so we would have ex examined that. We would have spoken to electors as they come into these, to, to the stations, um, ascertaining their, their, you know, their information. We looked at a number of things, um, spoke, the chief of mission would have spoken with the media and, and given a press release and things like that. So, and then of course you have um, post election where you look at in, well, in Guyana's case, because um, their results have to be tabulated and it does take some time to do that because of the vastness of the country. Um, we would have stayed a few days uh, observing that tabulation process and would have been there uh, when things started to go awry in relation to the, you know, the tabulation of the results for region four. Uh, and thereafter that um, we played uh, what I would say a very unique role in terms of, of, of having uh, or, or, or working towards the, the, the final outcome and alleviating the situation. And so the head of CARICOM at the time who was prime minister Mia Motley uh, together with my Prime Minister, Dr. Keith Rowley, and the Prime Minister of St. Vince, uh, at, no, I think it was Grenada, uh, uh, Dr. Mitchell. They led that delegation, visited Guyana, and um, got agreement between the former, prime, the former Prime Minister and the then leader of the opposition to have a high level delegation come in and um, supervise what was, was supposed to be a recount of region four and eventually became a recount or count of all 10 regions. Um, it did take some time uh, for the, the parameters of the high level team to be um, determined. When the first high level team went in, uh, there was uh, a litigation filed against the team and so on, and that took its course. Um, but the end result of that is a second high level delegation went in and um, they defined the scope. They were able to define the scope of, of, of what that team was supposed to do uh, or scrutinize or supervise. I mean, these, these are terms you know, as, and as, as Mr. Carter said, this is where the, law, the lawyering comes in and, and one's interpretation of what's scrutiny versus supervise and so on. All of those things became issues before the court, but it was decided eventually what the ambit um, or the terms of reference of that high level delegation would be. And so a second um, team went in led by Cynthia, um, Barrow Giles, who is a senior lecturer at the University of the West Indies in Cave Hill campus. And she, together with a commissioner, um, a sitting commissioner from the Antigua and Barbuda Commission, as well as, a, I think he's the deputy chief elections officer from St. Vincent, the three of them um, took on the task of, of, of scrutinizing 
um, what that recount process for the 10 regions. It took a few weeks well, um, but the end result uh, was a report um, that highlighted several inconsistencies um, and, 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 and the fact that um, the, what, who was the opposition party at the time? Um, so the opposition party emerging as the, um, well, the, the ruling government. Um, and that's not to say that the, there was some time between the, the, the laying of the report and the eventual swearing in of the government. There was some toing and froing there from a legal perspective, people not accepting the report. Um, the chief elections officer in, in um, GCOM doing some very different, um, doing some very, very, that, very taking a, a different approach and, and, and seemingly Um, while we are uh, oh, there, okay, she's back. Uh, okay, maybe, um, Fern, we'll try to get back to you. I think your connection is perhaps a little bit unstable, um, but I think she has laid out very well what some of the challenges were. And on top of this, we have to remember that by this point, um, all countries had suspended flights. And so even for this team to go back in high level as they were, then there were objections from the GCOM to um, what they had to do in order to, uh, to, to enter the country because of uh, the coronavirus. So let me now just turn quickly to, um, to Pauline, to Ms. Chase and um, representing the Bar Association that both observed the elections, but also had members who were um, arguing the cases as well as they came up uh, for litigation. So over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Ambassador Page. Uh, can you hear me? Am I, am I You're being good. Heard? Great. Perfect. Okay, perfect. Thank you, it is such a delight to be with you and uh, everyone this morning. Thank you again for having me. Thank you to the University of Michigan for the kind invitation to be part of the panel discussion this morning. Uh, the last time I saw Ambassador Page and Mr. Carter, uh, Jason as, as I like to call him, we were in circumstances I believe none of us would have wished to be under if we had a choice. So it, I must say it is a distinct pleasure to see them this morning under different circumstances. I have been asked to give uh, brief opening remarks. And with that, I hope to not only uh, lay out the work of the Bar Association, but to also convince you that not all lawyers are, as we say in Guyana, long-winded, which means that we're both. I know J Jason was working on his Guyanese parlance while he was here. I don't know if he picked up that one. <laughs> anyway, I will just try to give a, a brief overview of the work of the Bar Association. The speakers before me have um, laid out uh, quite well and in quite good detail, I think, to um, provide for discussion uh, the circumstances surrounding uh, the election. So it's made my work a little bit easier. I think they're, um, at least Jason is a de facto Guyanese by now. Uh, so as mentioned, I am the secretary of the Bar Association of Guyana or the Guyana Bar Association, as we're also called. The Bar Association of Guyana, as is the American Bar Association, is a voluntary membership association comprising of attorneys at law admitted to practice in Guyana. It is the recognized body representing the interests of attorneys at law in Guyana. The Bar Association has been involved in elections and the election process in Guyana for quite some time, dating back to as far as the 1970s, in varying capacities and for varying reasons. The association has the expressed mandate under its rules to uphold the rule of law, a mandate which we take quite seriously. It is our view that any threat to democracy, any subversion of free and fair elections is a threat to the rule of law. The Bar Association has a honorable record, a historical record when it comes to elections and democracy in Guyana. 
We served an important and leading role as a civil society organization in the 1970s, 80s, and 90s for the return of free and fair elections in Guyana, a process of which we were robbed from 1964 to 1992, when we suffered what is now widely accepted as rigged elections under the then PNC government. We were able to regain free and fair elections, not only by the work of the Bar Association and other such organizations, but also through the instrumental work of the Carter Center and former President Jimmy Carter himself, to whom Guyanese owe tremendous amount of gratitude. I don't think we can ever, ever repay for, for what President Carter did for us in 1992. The Bar Association, comprising of independent attorneys at law, of varying backgrounds served and we continue to serve an important role in society. Generally, when lawyers talk, more so as a body, because it, as you can imagine, it would be difficult to get more than one attorney to agree on anything. People listen. People listen when attorneys speak, uh, not, notwithstanding the lawyer jokes, or at least so we tell ourselves. Now the role of the Bar Association in the observation of the 2020 elections did not start on election day, March 2nd, 2020, or even nomination day, which was January 10th, 2020, which is the usual official starting point for election observation missions. We like to think we were there from the beginning. We were there from the beginning and we're still here in the post-election period. The well-documented shenanigans and which you would have heard a bit of already this morning, surrounding the 2020 general and regional elections in Guyana did not start on March 2nd, or even with the passage of the no confidence mode to which Jason referred, uh, which was passed on December 21, 2018. It started years before, in about 2016, with the selection and appointment of the all-powerful chairman of the Guyana Elections Commission, GCOM. This is when the, the concern and the alarm bells started to ring and sound in Guyana. After a somewhat public row and rejection by the president of the list of persons from whom to choose as supported by the leader of opposition and as mandated by Article 161 of the Constitution. And that uh, provision was amended to provide for what we call the Carter formula for the selection of the chairman. So before the selection of the chairman was done by the president in his sole discretion, after the 92 election uh, and some consultation, it was viewed that that was not a good process and it should be changed. So it was changed to be a more consultative process where the president would choose from a list supplied by the leader of the opposition. That was not being done uh, for uh, in about 2016 when the then chairperson uh, signaled his intention to resign. So a private citizen, Marcel Gaskin, approached the court in 2017 for an interpretation of that article of the Constitution. And that is what set all the following court matters and court cases in action. The Bar Association joined these proceedings, the proceedings uh, filed by Marcel Gaskin, and we did so amicus. That means as a friend of the court, we took no side. We were there just to offer the court support and assistance uh, if we could be. And it was a move for which we were commended by the Honorable Chief Justice uh, acting in her judgment, in her written judgment. Now, leading up to the 2020 elections, the Bar Association played a very active role of advocacy through the release of statements, meeting with other local civil society organizations, international bodies, lending support to those organizations, and as mentioned, joining in court proceedings. By the declaration of results on August 2nd, 2020, there were 10 matters filed in court, touching and concerning the elections and involving the High Court, the Full Court, the Court of Appeal, and the Caribbean Court of Justice. The law and lawyers took center stage. After comments started to appear in the media by the then government and persons aligned with that government, including an attorney at law, questioning the legality and effect of the no confidence motion which was passed in the National Assembly. The Bar Association released a statement unequivocally rejecting those contentions or any contention that the motion was not valid and lawfully passed for any reason. It was a strong statement and a statement for which we were criticized, of course, but we were vindicated by the court, the Caribbean Court of Justice, when they so found. 
Now, after all the court challenges, uh, elections were finally proclaimed by the president in October 2019, notably outside of the constitutionally mandated three month period for the passage of the no confidence motion. So by the constitution article 106, elections should have been held within three months of the date of passing of the no confidence motion. As you can see, that was not done. We did not have elections until March 2nd, 2020. It should have been held by March 21st, 2019. So just about a year later. On our application, the Bar Association was accredited as a local observer of the 2020 general and regional elections. Uh, the association had been previously involved in election observation independently and through the Electoral Assistance Bureau, which was founded in June 1991, and of which the Bar Association was the founder. However, due to funding and other issues, the EAB was not in a position to observe the 2020 elections. And it was therefore decided that due to our continuous standing and involvement, the Bar Association would independently seek accreditation, which it so did and was granted. We observed 10 districts, uh, sorry, we observed three districts of the 10 electoral districts. Guyana is split up into 10 electoral districts. And as Fern mentioned, Guyana is a vast country. Some areas are only accessible by plane, some by boat. So we, we are a big country. We chose those three regions, four, five, and six, because we thought those would be the most contentious and most likely to give rise to issues and therefore focus our attention on those districts. Our team comprised of about 20 attorneys at law who were all volunteers. We collaborated with other civil society organizations for training and relied on each other for logistical support that may be needed on election day. Some of our members also had previous observer experience and assisted with training and other such matters. Training ensured that we understood the system, what was to take place, when and how, and that we understood our role and rights as observers. <laughs> there was no training, however, that prepared us for what ensued after uh, March 2nd, 2020. And I will say that quite, uh, I would admit to that. The sense in factions of the country leading up to the elections were that it would be rigged. How? No one knew or could seem to articul articulate, but the sense remained. Something was afoot. This was the first election of which the PNC had control after being ousted from power in 1992 after the return of free and fair elections. Elections in Guyana by their nature and history polarizing with the two main political giants, the PPP and PNC commanding the landscape. The history goes as far back as 1955 and I hope we'll get into more discussion on it. I wouldn't uh, deal with it right now. Tensions are high, racial tensions are high. Neutrality, an unfamiliar description as actions are seen through a political lens. It is either you're with us or you're against us. Between March 2nd and August 2nd, 2020, the Bar Association had cause to speak through the release of statements on six occasions. Three occasions alone in July with regard to conduct. By that time, census had become even more heightened than attacks on the judiciary attorneys at law who were taking center stage on both sides, diplomats, and generally persons in the execution of their professional duties had reached unacceptable levels. This of course in itself placed us under attack from government and government aligned sources. We as also diplomats, other local and international observers, judicial officers, attorneys at law and in their individual capacities and our members, and persons not following the narrative were seen as partisan and biased. Uh, there, was even a, there was even a show in, uh, that came over on Facebook in the evenings and it always ended with good night to everyone except someone in particular. So one night it was good night to everyone except ambassador uh, of America. Uh, one night it was good night to everyone except the Guyana Bar Association. We took it as a compliment. Uh, fortunately, lawyers have thick skins and uh, <laughs> our guide is on only the rule of law and where the chips fall. Well, they fall. We take comfort that we have always stood on the right side of the law and in good company at all times, executing our mandate to uphold the rule of law. And I look forward to a very vibrant discussion. I hope I've given you some uh, food for thought and some information that you can use. And thank you. And I look forward to answering your questions.
Thank you very much, Pauline, uh, Fern, and Jason. Um, these were excellent uh, opening remarks and comments. Um, I would just note, especially that um, the elections, election day took place on March 2nd of 2020, and the president was not sworn in until three months later. So, um, uh, and even now, there are challenges that are still ongoing. And I think Pauline will get to that, but I, I think you wanted to add something. Go ahead, Pauline. No, I would say it was five months, not three months. The oh, five months, five sorry, months. sorry. Yeah, election day was on March 2nd and the president was sworn in on August 2nd. Yes, yeah, sorry, I mean, my, my mistake, exactly. That's all right. No, thank you. We, we don't um, want to rob them the time. <laughs> <laughs> no, but you know, what is, um, I think, I think one of the big questions that will come up, and you just raised this, um, is the bias that can be, that people can be accused of. So um, I want to get to the student's question, but I will take my, uh, my, my mediator, my uh, moderator role um, uh, permission and ask that first question. If each of you could just briefly say how that played out, did you um, feel used or abused by um, being a, an election observer, either from the region for uh, uh, an international observer from outside, i.e. the Carter Center, uh, or from the Bar Association, and what you witnessed, because there were a zillion observers. I mean, this was uh, the election rooms where uh, the counting was going on, I mean, were, were really full and they actually had to limit the number of, uh, of accredited observers who could be in the counting room at any one time because there were so many organizations that were part of it. So if you could just speak briefly about, um, you know, what you saw or how you felt um, from your organization standpoint um, about perhaps being targeted or uh, as we know, in some cases, being asked to leave, um, being kind of not admitted in. Um, how, how was that? Uh, let's start with Jason. Sure. Uh, thank you so much. And, and number one, just for Ms. Narciscope's uh, benefit, we, uh, as you got cut off, we did mention the fact that CARICOM was, as you were just about to say, sort of the crucial and only observers that were allowed in at the end. And, and I think uh, that role that CARICOM played is important on this question of sort of neutrality and, and bias. I mean, in a, we all, if you live in, in Michigan, you know, in the United States or wherever you are at home, you know, we all are aware that things become highly politicized. And when it's a very polarized environment, if you tell something that is, you know, your version of the facts, uh, people who are just, um, who, for whom that's not a good fact, uh, are going to accuse you of bias, right? There's a huge level of, of, of polarization and attacks. And, and, and Ms. Chase um, put it very well that, you know, that on some level you take it as a badge of honor. The, the Carter Center itself, obviously, being an outside organization is, is helpful. We, we don't have a history um, of being affiliated with one side or the other. We don't stay in the community in ways that people can then use whatever history we have as evidence of bias. As as uh, Ms. Chase mentioned, the Carter Center observed an election. The PNC in um, Guyana is in many ways the, the party of the Afro-Guyanese community, at least that's the, the politically polarized uh, sort of majority uh, within that political party. And that party was in power for many years and the Carter Center came and observed an election that transferred power from the PNC to the PPP, which is the opposition party. We then came back and observed an election that transferred power from the PPP to the PNC, right? So we've been there for these transitions in power in both ways uh, over time. Uh, nonetheless, uh, we were certainly accused um, of bias. Uh, and one of the reasons that it's so difficult, for example, um, for the Carter Center or, or any other organization group to come to the United States uh, to start talking and observing elections is because of the highly polarized nature of both our uh, political discourse and our media coverage um, that makes it difficult, frankly, to come in and, and provide neutral um, analysis of election issues because every fact on an election, every every interpretation of the law is going to have a winner and a loser, at least in some context, and that that raises um, questions of bias. But it's something that we try to confront 
uh, all the time in every single election that we um, have observed. It is, and it is a, a larger and smaller issue over time. But I think ultimately, um, particularly with respect to the PNC government, uh, the CARICOM um, uh, officials and delegation really had the most um, credibility with that, with that uh, uh, political party. And, um, and, and had credibility across the board. And so it became very, very important that they were there uh, at the end of the day um, to, 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 um, to really uh, supervise or scrutinize or whatever the appropriate legal term is uh, for, so. Thanks, so maybe because we're gonna give um, Ms. Narcissus scope the last word since CARICOM is the one who at the end of the day was sort of the last uh, body standing to, um, to have a say. So uh, Ms. Chase, why don't we turn to you? Um, again, I think because the Bar Association had been so engaged as lawyers, as a body of lawyers, um, how was it for you all given uh, you know, what you saw and um, what was being played out? Thank you. So we had a really unique role because we, as you said, we're a body of lawyers and we were involved as an association and um, our members involved in the litigation on both sides. And we also had the unique perspective that we were local observers. So with local observers comes familiarity. And that is a double-edged sword. Mm -hmm. So it works both ways. It has its advantages and it has its, its disadvantages. So we were accused of uh, bias, but as I said, it was just uh, because the environment was so heightened and so tense. I mean, this was called the mother of all elections. Guyana is, is on the verge of being an oil producer. Um, so that, with that backdrop also, it, these elections were just, all eyes were on these elections. And um, it was just a very tight and tense uh, situation. So we did not uh, let it affect us. As I said, lawyers have uh, thick skins and we took comfort in the fact that we were at all, all times on the side of the rule of law and we were in good company because fortunately we were not the only ones staying in. And it was so important to have observer missions of varying uh, backgrounds. So you had the local observers and you had the international observers and they were all in tangent international and local observers. So uh, as a body, as a grouping of observers, then we were able to protect each other, um, even if it was an unspoken protection, but we were able to move in tandem because we were all seeing the same thing. We were all experiencing the same thing. There was no uh, sugar coating. There was nothing subversive or perverse about it. So uh, it did not affect our work and the positions that we took. Uh, so yes, there were um, allegations of, of bias, but there were allegations of bias against everyone who was not taking, who was not taking uh, a particular narrative, which I mean, truthfully just could not be taken if you, if you experienced what you experienced and you saw and you observed what you observed. So it, 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 does, um, it does play out. And as I said, familiarity is a double-edged sword. Uh, so it, we're not, we were not immune from it, but we did not allow it to affect us and the work with which we, uh, we undertook to do, we were mandated to do. That's good. So um, let's turn back to um, Mrs. Narcissus scope, because I think, you know, that perspective, I think it's easier sometimes to um, be called out when you really are alone, um, when you're kind of that outlier organization, body, entity that is saying, no, everything was perfect or everything was, was not good, um, but you're standing independently. Uh, in this case, I think um, Ms. Chase is right that I think everyone had really the benefit of being united in what was seen because it was so brazen. Um, but uh, let me turn to you now um, for the final word before we open it up to questions from, from uh, our listeners. Um, how was it from the CARICOM perspective because your organization really did stand up and um, took a very firm stance with the government and the elections body, which was difficult to do because yes. I mean, this as I mean, we've all noted the stakes were so high. Um, well, 
CARICOM's election observer missions generally tend to be well accepted in the region. And that is because its components tend to be election management um, professionals. Yes, so that um, we, we have found that in any country that, that CARICOM um, enters for election observer missions, there tends to be a certain level of acceptance um, and, and welcoming of, of the CARICOM um, observer teams. But what subsequently transpired in Guyana, I mean, none of us could have ex expected um, that things would play out in the manner that it did. And um, that observer team, we did our work, that first team, that team for the, the, the March 2nd election, we would have done our work um, looking at the, the atmosphere and the, the, the processes in relation to Guyana's legislation, right? And, and, and to the unseeing eye, all things appeared to be above board. But somehow in the tabulation process, um, that is when things went awry, you know, or things have started to go awry and revealed that other things had happened, you know. Um, the high level team, the first high level team um, that was sent in uh, by Prime Minister Motley, of which I was initially a member, um, was meant met with a, a certain level of, of suspicion and aggression because by then um, it, things had deteriorated. I think there was such public distrust mm -hmm. in what had transpired. Um, but there was, there, I think there was a general consensus that GCOM, the public confidence and distrust in, D, in GCOM had so eroded that there was a need for somebody or entity to, to supervise, and I use that word, um, the, 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 the recount process. Um, and as the, Mia Motley was able to agree to get um, the, the, the former prime minister and the opposition party to agree to CARICOM. Um, and, and perhaps because of the role that CARICOM, is, it was not the first time. I think I understand in, in, 19, in, in the 1990s, CARICOM had played a similar role for a previous election um, that, that Guyana had had. had. So um, they, they were able to agree that CARICOM would play that, um, well, there was that mediation that, that, that um, Prime Minister Motley engaged in. And then that's, that subsequent um, supervising of the recount process. Um, but there was a certain level of, of, of there was suspicion, uh, allegations that were thrown. But I'll tell you something. Huh? One, one of the things about being an election management professional is that I think all of us in our respective countries, we are subject to that. I mean, certainly um, Trinidad and Tobago had its election on the heels of Guyana's. And as the CEO of, of TNT, I would have had my fair share or my baptism of fire, as I call it, um, in dealing with political parties and 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 all sorts of allegations. So I think I think the 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 participants in in CARICOM election observer missions, because we are all involved in election management, we are accustomed to to you know at home being being um, being the target. Of, of, of political parties and so on. And so that when, um, even in Guyana, when we, we did encounter some of that, it did not cause us any real um, tribulation because as I said, we, we are somewhat accustomed um, and, and are able to do our work um, in that type of environment because that is the environment we all function in as it relates to election management anyway, you know? So, um, I am happy to say that what CARICOM was able to do, and certainly as a, as a, as a chief elections officer um, in the business of elections for the last 10 years, it was the first time I had seen anything like what happened in, 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 in Guyana from a professional perspective. So that for us as well, it was also 
uh, an opportunity, CARICOM missions an opportunity for peer review as we look at the work that, that our respective countries are engaging in in election management. And we learn from one another. And in this case, certainly what not to do, right? <laughs> certainly what not to do. Um, in, in, you know, and the need for, 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 for the organization, how important public confidence and public trust is in an organization that is the election management body. And what public trust and confidence is eroded, what that could do to a nation. I think that is one of the key learnings that came out of this entire Guyana experience. You know, that none of us would want to be in that situation, you know, especially as someone working for an election management body. That erosion of public distrust really, really can thwart the, the whole essence of democracy. And I think that for me was one of the great takeaways of the whole the, the Guyana experience. Um, Mr. Carter, I think you wanted to add something. I, I just want to say, I mean, the credibility, the, the, the way that she just put it is exactly right. When the election system itself loses credibility, um, you have a really serious problem. It's very hard to get it back. It takes a lot of different stakeholders to come together and to say, we're going to, we're going to trust in this system again. And it, it is just fundamentally uh, a very difficult situation. And again, the Carter Center has confronted that in other countries uh, many, many times. And, and part of what we've been able to do uh, is to add some credibility to the process um, by beginning at the very beginning. And, and, and perhaps, you know, answering the student question that at least was put out at the beginning is, is, is a way to do this. I don't want to jump ahead, but I, that, that credibility is just so important. I just wanted to amplify and echo what, what Ms. Narciscop said for sure. Yeah, great. All right, well, I am going to let um, our participants uh, ask questions. Um, maybe I would start actually with asking you to raise your hand. Um, and of course, if John, uh, Professor Chachori, if you have anything you would like to uh, ask as well, um, but let's see if uh, the students can raise their hands first. Sure. And, and there's, um, there's also one good question in the chat. I, I thought that I was trying to ask that um, okay. or answer that, but um, okay. why don't we go ahead? Um, Sylvia, if you're still on, would you like to ask that or amplify exactly your comment? Or Sylvia's on mute if she is talking. All right, thank you. <laughs> forget, forget to unmute myself. Um, I had a good friend who was an international observer at a, a, an important election in Latin America. Uh, and his feelings about what he had done were mixed because he was, of course, honored to have been invited as an international observer. And he did not see any problems in the particular setting in which he was asked to observe. But he, but he said, but that doesn't mean that there weren't things happening in other places. And perhaps our invitation as an international observer was a way of legitimating an election that you know, ha perhaps had some fraud, some fraud associated with it. Uh, and it was a way of covering that up. So I was just wondering, since some of you guys have been international observers, how you felt about that, you know, the difference between the little space that you're asked to oversee and what could be happening elsewhere and how you get used in the process. So, May I take this one? Yeah, please. So I, I think, I, you know, the Carter Center, as I said, has, has sort of since 1989 in many ways really created the space of, of election observation in these ways, um, and especially international election observation. Um, and, and now it is, it, is, it is a very robust, um, you know, international space that, that includes perhaps the most effectively the, the examples of CARICOM in this instance, um, but there's regional bodies and, and the European Union and others, the Commonwealth uh, uh, that all uh, participate in a huge, in a huge way. But the, the fundamental sort of aspect of, of international observation 
it's, it begins really with a, a long process. And the, the Carter Center, if we go in, we're going to have long-term observers that will be there for months, uh, it's often in advance of an election, certainly many, many weeks, to go and observe each aspect of the process. And so I, I think that um, you know, the, the, the question of credibility is an important one and, and the value of international observers is very, very high in many places where the internal credibility has been questioned. Um, and the ability of international observers to actually locate and find issues is, is really high, in part because you observe each aspect of the process and you have to ensure that the process itself has sufficient transparency, has sufficient credibility, so that once the international observers get to election day, for example, like your friend Sylvia, who was on a short term election day observation mission, once they get to the day, we'll know that there are processes in place, for example, for party observers of the various different parties to all be present in every single precinct. In Guyana, for example, there were, there were for the most part, there were party observers from both of the two main political parties in every single precinct, uh, you know, certainly 99%. And so if you're talking about international observers being able to observe election day issues, um, that can be complicated. But when you couple that with the fact that we've got teams of international observers from many, many places uh, that work together we had many meetings with CARICOM, many meetings with the EU and Commonwealth and all of the international observers, plus meetings with the domestic observers and the political parties. You're talking about a process that gets put into place that then has credibility because the process itself is self-sustaining. And so I think it has real value to have international observers come validate the process that's being used, demonstrate so to people in a particular polarized environment why the process uh, is used using best practices or meets international standards for transparency, et cetera. And so I think it's very difficult, frankly, and this will hearten some of you about the American election. It's very difficult to quote, steal an election on election day. It is very difficult. It requires, uh, it would it'd be almost impossible to do it without detection. And so you'll have irregularities, but in order to really truly affect the outcome of an election, there has to be systemic issues at play or as we saw in Guyana, uh, a problem with tabulating the results, right? Because that's a point at which the entire system funnels into a single set of people. And so in Guyana, they started announcing results. The results looked bad for, the, for, the, for, for one of the political parties. And so they stopped the counting process and just announced results that had nothing to do with it. And that tabulation process when they sought to certify those results was a real problem. So the counting and tabulation process is also something that either has transparency or it doesn't but the international community's ability uh, to see what's going on and to look at the system as a whole, I think is really robust and it provides a lot of credibility. Thank you. Maybe, maybe okay. just to, to add, um, maybe uh, any of you can take this, but you know there is kind of a checklist to a certain extent of what makes an election free and fair. And of course, that's not just election day. It's all of the things that lead up to election day. So um, Ms. Chase mentioned a number of the issues that had gone into even how the election commission is, is nominated and whether or not the, um, the process of uh, the, no con the vote of no confidence, whether that was object objected to. Uh, uh, Ms. Narciss Scope also mentioned that they look at the legislation. And I would just um, say that uh, I know with the Carter Center, um, we also had, the Carter Center also had a legal uh, person on their long-term observation team. And I was privileged to be able to actually watch some of the court hearings, which I found fascinating as a lawyer and just to see what um, the constitution of Um, of, of both sides. But maybe uh, one of you can talk a little bit about um, what you actually look at. What are um, the criteria going into elections uh, that you look at to see what kind of uh, playing field you're dealing with? Um, if I might. Uh, when, when, one, when we head into a, a CARICOM country, um, one of the things that I think I mentioned before, the advanced team that does is 
um, have meetings with various stakeholders. And while um, CARICOM missions tend to be short-term missions, really just about 10 days or more, um, just a little more than 10 days, the, the purpose of meeting with the stakeholders, the election stakeholders, is to ascertain, um, from get a real sense of what um, the, the various important stakeholders feel about the election process going into election day. And that gives us a lot of information lot of important information. So um, the advanced team in the case of Guyana would have heard um, a lot of stories and concerns being expressed, that distrust of, of, of you know, the system going into the election, that, that was clear, um, that there were issues, there had been issues with voter registration, that the lists could be bloated and things like that. So that while um, we do not have the benefit of a long-term mission, that it does not prevent the, some of the issues, the in-country or host country issues, election issues coming to the fore by stakeholder meetings. On, on election day though, we look, we, and that, that's where the focus now turns to the actual legislation governing the election process. And you're looking for an adherence to procedure, right? Um, as I've said, that the procedures really are very similar um, in, in, in across the CARICOM nations. We do not have electro electronic voting. Voting is, is manual in the, in the true sense of, 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 of the process. And so that there are procedures that, that are required for opening of the poll to ensure transparency, you open the ballot box to make sure it's empty, right? Before you, you, you know, you start polling and so on, right? You have the presence of polling agents, and these polling agents represent the political parties contesting the election in each polling station. And they all of these, these are these are in built-in systems to an, ensure transparency and accountability on, on poll day. So what we are looking for on poll day is an adherence to the legislation and the procedures for the conduct of the poll. Because it is it is a deviation from that 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 really would be the irregularities that Mr. Carter spoke about, the election day irregularities that Mr. Carter spoke about, right? So you're looking to ensure that, that um, as far as humanly possible, the majority of your poll day staff, right, would be adhering to election procedures. So that gives you a sense that at least from a procedural perspective on the day, whether or not that had been correctly implemented. Right? But of course, as Mr. Carter has indicated, bringing an election, I wonder, I myself wonder, how is that even humanly possible? Because <laughs> certainly not on election day. That is, is a concerted effort and conspiracy over an extended period of time, right? So that you, you, you cannot see it as, as I think um, Sylvia, indicated it is not something her colleague her friend indicated it's not something that you could really see on the on election day election day you're looking for an adherence to procedures um and of course in the counting of the of the ballots and the tabulation process again all of that is procedure so it is when that procedural impropriety um that led us to where we you know all that happened in in guyana so it's it's really Everything is legislated um, from, from the very inception, the register, how you register voters, how you delineate boundaries and how the co you conduct the election. All of that is legislated. So what you are really looking for um, in, in, in a true sense is to ensure that the election management body or whatever other body is responsible for some arm or aspect of the, the conduct of the election they have followed procedure. And once you, once you see that happening, I think it gives um, the election observer team, short term or long term, um, um, the ability to say that, you know, the election was credible and transparent and free and fair. Great, thank you. Um, I see only one other hand right now. So Professor Torciari, um, I'll hand over the floor to you. 
Thanks. Uh, I wanted to pick up on a comment that Mr. Carter made earlier about the importance of media and spin in the aftermath of any electoral dispute. Certainly, we're worried about that right now in the U.S. And I'd be very interested in your comments from the perspective of your respective organizations. What role did a media strategy play in your work? Did you anticipate that you would need not only to observe what was happening, but that you would need to translate that into uh, a more even-handed coverage in the Guyanese uh, media? Um, I'll answer very briefly, and then I would be very interested to hear Pauline, uh, who knows the media environment there better uh, than we do. Um, the Guyana almost has one newspaper for every citizen. Uh, I mean, it, it is a it is a very robust media environment. Some of them are very uh, you know skewed towards one political party or the other. Uh, so you're going to have a lot of information that gets out there. Um, we really, uh, for the most part, one of the big advantages that we have now is that we can go in many ways directly to the to the people uh, because we'll we'll uh, have a press conference, we'll post it on Twitter or on Facebook, uh, and people will go and hear what it is that we have to say. So we have. Um, we had an, an aggressive, I would say, uh, communications plan that involved us just talking very, very directly to the Guyanese people. Um, and, and so it would get covered in the media in the ways that it would get covered. But I think we were able in many ways, and certainly our most effective communication, we were able to go directly um, to, to the Guyanese people and have these discussions. And so it's a, it is crucially important, um, as, as you mentioned. And one of the things that the Carter Center has looked at, in addition to sort of the traditional mainstream media uh, that we uh, see in the United States, and obviously that everybody realizes is being um, joined at least, if not completely subsumed by uh, the social media outlets that are out there, those social media outlets and the fact that people get their news there um, is the subject of a huge amount of study that the Carter Center is engaging in. And I'll just say before before concluding that it's not only in, in the United States that, that social media is driving many people's views and opinions of um, of elections and of the credibility of their institutions, but it's everywhere. I mean, in, not just in Guyana, um, but even in Liberia, you know, in West Africa, which is one of the poorest countries in the world, um, and it has very limited, uh, you know, infrastructure in a host of ways. You're still talking about an election that was, in many ways, dominated from a media standpoint uh, by by social media. And so it's a it is a new environment. There's pluses and minuses, but from our standpoint, you know, as we analyze those digital threats to democracy on an ongoing basis, uh, we also in Guyana, at least, really took advantage of that medium. Uh, to go directly and, and have our, our statements um, made directly to the to the people. I, if uh, before I, I let um, Ms. Chase answer as well, I, I just wanted to add one thing that um, I think it's important to note both in the Caricom region, the twenty uh, the the twenty bodies, uh, the the fact that Ms. Uh, Narcis Scope mentioned the youth. Um, these are people who are very savvy with technology. And the same is true in, uh, on the African continent where uh, there's a massive youth bulge and they want the same opportunities, of course, that everybody wants you know, jobs and you know, the opportunity to prosper. And they are much more clever at all of these kinds of new technologies um, than many of us who did not grow up with that. So. Uh, it is definitely something to watch. And uh, let me just let uh, Ms. Chase add. Pauline? Pauline, we were throwing it to you to talk about the media. Sorry. Oh, oh, sorry. I think my connection just was just a bit unstable. Over to me now. Yes. So the media, thank you. The media has played a very important, crucial role in the 2020 elections in Guyana. Um, that is the short answer. We have come a long way historically. So in the 70s and 80s, uh, the media also did play an important role, but there was also uh, oppression of the media during that time uh, because of foreign currency and other restrictions and other uh, mechanisms. For instance, newsprint was difficult to get and was even banned at one point. So the printing of newspapers to get to get the news out and to get your views out where it was a difficult thing. 
uh, but those that were able to do it did use it as a powerful tool uh, at that time. Fast forward to 2020. Uh, we now have an open economy, we have the internet, and not only did the mainstream media, which is the print, TV, and news play an important role, but also as Jason touched, social media played an important role. And not, um, and not a structured social media, so it was not necessarily a news outlet uh, through social media, but just someone being able to have their phone in the tabulation center and broadcasting what was going on. So people were able on the outside to see in real and lifetime because the media were not allowed in the tabulation center. Uh, the tabulation, I'm saying the tabulation center, there were actually 10 tabulation centers. The hotspot was region, was district four, the one in Georgetown, um, which is the most populated, it's, it's our city. The media was not allowed in that building. They were actually treated quite, quite horribly. Um, they had to stay outside. They had to wait for, for persons to go outside to speak with them. They did not have access. Um, but to their benefit and to their credit, they really with, withstood all the insult that was, that was hurled at them with, their, with the bad treatment. And they did carry the news. Uh, they, they spoke to both sides. Uh, I think they did a good job in trying to get the message out. Our statements, we've always had cooperative media. They've always uh, been very friendly to us in carrying our statements and our views. And as Jason mentioned, he was also able to speak to the media as a, a foreign observer. And they uh, were, carried his views too, but not only mainstream media, but I think uh, more so than mainstream media, social media, the opening of the internet and having that direct contact to persons and to persons around the world um, because it wouldn't only be persons in Guyana. So I had family and friends from as far as Germany and Africa calling me and texting me about what was going on. Because it's Guyana and we're so polarized, there are allegations of who's on which side, um, but they did do a good job. And I would say more so social media, the access to social media was even more important. I hope I answered your question. If not, feel free to give me a follow-up question. Perfect. No, thank you so much. Um, well, we are with really about one minute left. Um, so I um, have not ask, asked the question that I think everyone wants to know. If in literally 10 seconds, what is the most important thing each of the three of you believe to watch for in the US elections in less than a month? Jason, we'll start with you. Uh, the most important thing is, is how we all, um, we need to watch and be careful in the way that we all talk on social media and in the mainstream media about what's gonna impact, quote, the election and to make sure that we are not calling into question the integrity of the election unless there's truly something big that's going on. And I think we've got to be careful to separate out issues that are important um, and that could impact or undermine the credibility of the election from issues that are just the stuff that happens in elections. As, as good as, as, as people are at, at administering them, uh, you know, you, you got to be careful in the way that we talk about it because undermining that credibility um, really, really is a, is a tough thing to come back from. Thank you. Um, Mrs. Narcisco. Um, I think I want to agree with Mr. Carter that um, the U.S. has very ro robust uh, election management systems, um, slightly different in, in across the states, but very robust nonetheless. And um, I think uh, the interest in the election is keen. Um, I, I, I am anticipating COVID-19 aside, uh, a strong election turnout. And, and so certainly from the CARICOM perspective, we are looking, it is a pity that we will not be able to mount um, uh, uh, or participate in, in an observer mission in the US. There's a lot of learning that can be gauged from, from visiting the US for the purpose of the election. But I, I see strong and very robust election management processes across the various states. And I expect a, a very high One, one needs to be able to decipher this media spin that will create that um, distrust as opposed to 
what you know whether something there's 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 a reality and a need to be actually be concerned so i i think i i believe that um that one could reasonably anticipate a free and fair election as is the 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 the, the history of of the us in in the election management thank you very much uh, very quickly ms chase <laughs> In 10 seconds, protect your process. Um, it is the most important thing that you have. Our Guyanese have lived the, the erosion of the system. We've lived it since 1964, and we continue to live it in various, uh, in various means. As Jason mentioned, uh, the, the confidence in the system. So if third world countries really have a say in first world matters, but if I could, I would say protect your system. You have a good system. It's a robust system. We all do. And, and what is our saving grace is the protection of that system. So be vigilant and protect the system. I want to thank the three of you very much. Those are very powerful words to end on. Um, protect your system and be vigilant. Be careful about the words that we speak. I think all of that is really cri critically important. And um, again, I wanna thank the three of you for spending the time with us, taking time out to talk about the Guiana elections and really processes in general of electoral observation. So Mrs. Narcissus Scope, uh, Ms. Pauline Chase and Mr. Jason Carter, thank you, thank you very much again. And let me just turn it over lastly uh, to uh, Professor Chorciari, maybe for any closing remarks. Nothing except to echo my thanks for those great insights, both on the specific case of Guiana and election observation and systems more generally. Students, please stay tuned. We have more events coming up soon in our Global Perspectives uh, series on democracy and debate. So thanks, everybody, for coming. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Nice to see everyone. Great Thank to see you. Enjoy your days. Thank you. Thank you. Bye -bye. Thanks, everybody.